Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for July 23rd, 2021. I'm Glenn Fleischman, finishing out two weeks subbing for Jackson Bird, who is on vacation. Rounding errors may cause winners to become losers and losers winners. Bezos and James Webb both fall to earth. And beyond lobster shortages, now crabs. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. Rounding errors in digital stopwatches may be affecting the outcomes of athletic competitions, a new paper in the American Journal of Physics suggests. Quote, we present and analyze race times obtained from swimming competitions. The data give a clear demonstration of anomalous stopwatch timing patterns, which can only be explained by rounding error. It is also shown that such rounding error can result in a set of times being wrongly ordered in the context of a sporting event. This could lead to the incorrect ranking of athletes and, hence, the incorrect awarding of race positions. End quote. The issue is how digital timing devices count the passage of time. While there aren't gears and escapements, a digital timekeeping unit does track a physical property. A piece of quartz is cut into the shape of a tiny tuning fork, and very small amounts of power keep the quartz vibrating continuously. The quartz used has a vibrational rate of 32,768 hertz, or oscillations per second. A circuit of which the quartz is part counts these oscillations and drives either a digital display or even a conventional watch face. The accuracy can be on the order of about one second or less per day. In fact, it can shift either way, which over longer periods of time, like a month, acts to suppress some of the error. For short periods of timekeeping, the error over time isn't an issue, but the precision is. As the paper by David A. Foe and Janet Godolphin notes, quote, any algorithm that converts an integer quartz oscillator count to a floating point time and subsequently to integer digits for display will be subject to rounding error. End quote. With digital computers, floating point arithmetic describes how something that can only count whole numbers with limited precision can represent fractions of a whole, the amount to the right of the decimal point. Take the fraction one-third. We can write one slash three or 0 0.3 with a line over the three to indicate it repeats forever. But a computing device has to represent that as some number of threes. The amount of threes used is the precision. Some devices might show zero point followed by 16 threes, others five threes, others a hundred threes. To represent numbers that can range from small fractions to large whole numbers with and without fractions, there's a floating point. The decimal point can appear at various points in the number, and that's typically represented by an integer that's then multiplied by a power of 10. So, the problem this paper appears to have uncovered is that algorithms used in what are considered high-precision digital stopwatches produce unexpected patterns that can only result if the rounding upwards of a fraction captured by the device when it converts oscillations to numbers to display units is making poor choices. Otherwise, there would be a near-perfect distribution of hundredths of a second across results. Without having access to the actual hardware, the paper's authors took, quote, race times from two consecutive swimming competitions involving a total of 647 stopwatch timed swims. The competitions took place in a six-lane pool. Times were recorded by a timekeeper in each lane using personal and club stopwatches from a variety of manufacturers, end quote. Here's the crux, quote, under the null hypothesis that each hundredth was equally likely in each race time, the expected value of the test statistic is 99, and a test statistic exceeding 125 would indicate that the data deviated significantly from the null hypothesis. The realization of the test statistic is 740, which exceeds the expected value under the null hypothesis by approximately 45 standard deviations, a statistically impossible outcome if each hundredth is equally likely, end quote. Or, to quote Futurama, I see. Something involving that many big words could easily destabilize time itself. Is that a problem? Indeed so. At this rate, by Tuesday it will be Thursday, by Wednesday it will be August, and by Thursday it will be the end of existence as we know it. Let's unpick the paper's statement. What they're saying is that if all hundredths of a second from point zero zero to point nine nine are equally likely, then the random physical performance of people in those races would mean that the results across those races should really occur 
somewhat evenly across those 100 possibilities. The deviation is so extreme, it reveals that there's no way this occurred by chance. It, it must be a flaw in rounding. Quote, there are three digit pairs, namely 00, 50, and 75, which together account for more than one eighth of the results. Conversely, there are eight digit pairs with frequency zero, end quote. A chart with a paper reveals the pattern very obviously. The authors wonder, quote, it is unclear whether the process of converting such a set of times to digital display causes some time intervals to be stretched and others to be contracted whilst preserving the order within the set or whether the process can corrupt the true order of times, end quote. Is this important in competition? Well, yes. As the paper concludes, talking about a famous race, quote, the event was won by Michael Phelps by 0 0.01 seconds in a race that he appeared to have lost to Milorad Chavitz. The result secured Phelps his seventh gold medal. We emphasize that we have no evidence to suggest that timing anomalies occurred in the Phelps Chavitz race, or even that they exist in electronic timing systems used at high level sporting competitions where rounding error may be corrected. End quote. In a simulation, however, the writers were able to show that two swimmers recording a true time that is nine one hundredths of a second apart could be reversed in place of their actual time and shown as just one one hundredth second apart through compounded rounding errors from the quartz oscillation timing through floating point conversion to digital display. Now, this problem occurs constantly in everyday life. It's not only happening at hundredths of a second. A recent story in The Verge suggested that Apple's prudishness, seemingly contradicted by its Apple TV Plus show Dickinson, among other programming, had caused the company to prevent its weather app from showing the temperature 69 degrees Fahrenheit. After the story ran, however, an update appeared, quote, Apple may be sourcing data for its iOS weather app in Celsius and then converting it to Fahrenheit. For example, 20 degrees Celsius converts to 68 degrees Fahrenheit, while 21 degrees Celsius converts to 69.8 degrees Fahrenheit, which rounds up to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. The app appears to have similar issues with temperatures like 65 degrees, where 18 degrees Celsius converts to 64.4 degrees Fahrenheit, while 19 degrees Celsius is 66.2 degrees Fahrenheit, end quote. This problem recurs frequently with the scale I use to weigh myself due to some chronic health conditions that require routine monitoring to spot anomalies. After some time using it, I noticed that I weighed odd fractions of a pound that would vary up or down sometimes by, you know, 0.6 or 0.7 tenths of a pound. Since I weigh myself in the morning, my thinking process is usually not crisp enough to recognize patterns. But when I finally did the math, it was clear that the scale when displaying pounds is measuring in tenths of a kilogram and then converting those. Using Apple's health app to view the raw data, I can see that the weight is recorded in fractions as 0 0.13, 0 0.25, 0 0.47, 0 0.57, and yes, 0 0.69. These transform rather neatly into even kilogram fractions of 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, and so forth. Fortunately, I'm not trying to track my weight to tenths of a pound. There's no competition category for that that I'm trying to place in. Let me label this package of stories the men who fell to Earth. After Jeff Bezos' successful quick trip to the edge of space, he landed safely, but judges awarded him a lot of zeros for how he took the landing. Amazon's local paper, the Seattle Times, arrived at my doorstep the morning after the flight with the headline, quote, Jeff Bezos travels to space, draws backlash after landing. For what? Oh, for saying, I also want to thank every Amazon employee and every Amazon customer because you guys paid for all this. You're welcome. The result of Bezos's 10-minute joyride is a lot of political fallout. From CNN, quote, Representative Pramila Jayapal, chair of the House Progressive Caucus, retweeted CNN's story on Blue Origin this morning, adding, quote, On a related note, a wealth tax would generate at least $3 trillion for our communities, end quote. And Representative Jerry Nadler called the space flight self-indulgent and joins Jayapal and other progressives in calling for a wealth tax, quote, on mega billionaires like Bezos, end quote. CNN noted that Elizabeth Warren, always ahead of the curve, commented last month, quote, he's laughing at every person in America who actually paid taxes. Jeff Bezos's trip to outer space is being financed by all the rest of the U.S. taxpayers who paid their taxes so that Jeff Bezos didn't have to, end quote. The same day as the Blue Origin flight, the Federal Aviation Administration made an administrative change that affects bragging rights. From CNN, quote, 
The Federal Aviation Administration announced a change to its commercial astronaut wings program for the first time in 17 years. This shift at the dawn of the space tourism era means the U.S. government may not formally recognize that billionaires Jeff Bezos and Sir Richard Branson became astronauts when they blasted into space earlier this month, end quote. Beyond just reaching the U.S.-recognized boundary of space of 50 miles, which is not the higher 62-mile boundary that's internationally agreed upon, flyers can no longer be just cargo. Quote, commercial launch crew members must also demonstrate activities during flight that were essential to public safety or contributed to human spaceflight safety, an FAA spokesperson said, quoting the new order. When asked what the change in policy means for the most recent space tourists, an FAA spokesperson said that in order to get astronaut wings, a nomination is required, end quote. No nomination has yet been received for any of the recent flights. A few days ago, I described NASA's successful efforts to reboot the Hubble Space Telescope and noted that its successor may finally launch after decades of delay and a bloated budget of billions in November 2021. However, it might not keep the name it was dubbed with for much longer. From Nature Magazine, quote, NASA is considering whether to rename its flagship astronomical observatory, given reports alleging that James Webb, after whom it is named, was involved in persecuting gay and lesbian people during his career in government. Keeping his name on the $8.8 billion James Webb Space Telescope, set to launch later this year, would glorify bigotry and anti-LGBT plus sentiment, say some astronomers. But others say there is not yet enough evidence against Webb, who was head of NASA from 1961 to 1968, and they are withholding judgment until the agency has finished an internal investigation. End quote. 1,250 people have signed a petition to change the name, including scientists who have already booked time on the telescope. The effort is being led by four astronomers, including Seattle's own Sarah Tuttle. Quote, the four astronomers leading the renaming petition say that when Webb worked for the State Department in the high-ranking position of undersecretary from 1949 to 1952, he passed a set of memos discussing what was described as, quote, the problem of homosexuals and sex perverts, end quote, to a senator who was leading the persecution, end quote. Nature notes the decision to name the telescope for Webb was sudden and surprising at the time. Quote, former NASA administrator Sean O'Keefe named the James Webb Space Telescope after Webb in 2002 when the telescope was in the early stages of development. It was a unilateral decision that took many by surprise because NASA's telescopes are typically named after scientists, end quote. It's not a sop to sentiment, nor so-called political correctness, to rename projects and buildings dedicated to an individual who history has revealed the problematic nature of. People have to work in buildings, walk by monuments, and use technology like the joint NASA-European Space Agency and Canadian Space Agency Space Telescope, rejecting efforts to remove names of people engaged in discrimination or assault against individuals or groups continues the exclusion of them by the sheer persistence of the name. Just imagine going into work or study every day in the you suck and shouldn't exist building. No new name has yet been officially mooted. As Nature notes, quote, the final decision lies with NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, who has not said anything publicly on the matter. There is no clear list of alternative names, although many people have made unofficial suggestions. Walkovich and the other astronomers who are leading the petition suggest Harriet Tubman, after the formerly enslaved woman who fought to end slavery in the United States in the 19th century, and use the stars to guide black people to freedom. Sarov Jha, an astronomer at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey, suggests Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin, whose work revolutionized astronomers' understanding of the composition of the universe in the early 20th century. If you're a fan of eating sea animals that have shells, well, this is probably a really hard summer for you. You've probably already seen the stories earlier this year about the conjunction of the cost of lobster and restaurants and diners having to charge absurdly high prices. The New York Times story, Consider the $34 Lobster Roll, is a great example of the genre from June 11th. Quote, As with used cars and houses, the price spike in lobster meat is, in part, a matter of supply and demand exacerbated by the pandemic. Home cooks stuck inside during the lockdown, turned to all manner of seafood to expand their palates and learn new kitchen skills over the past year, end quote. The lobster fishing industry, however, isn't aligned with the demand side. Quote, there are roughly 4,500 licensed lobstermen in the state of Maine, and every fishing vessel is an independent operator. One person quoted in the story says, the fishery and the supply chain are completely disconnected. I cannot tell those boats to go fishing if a captain decides to take the day off. Now, I lived in Maine and sadly did not love lobster, but I did eat some. 
and in particular lobster rolls, because it was coming right out of the sea. It was caught right there. Lobster fishers have an incredible array of practices to avoid taking too many lobsters and removing larger, fertile female lobsters. While government regulations cover many aspects of their fishing, they also set their own stricter and specific rules within self-governing councils. An article just out yesterday in the industry publication Seafood Source says that despite predictions weeks ago that lobster prices might fall, it hasn't happened. And demand has remained unabated. Now, crabs are caught in greater variety and over a far larger range than lobsters, so they haven't had quite the same spike except for one particular prize variety, much like Maine lobsters. There's an unexpected shortage of blue crabs in Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. e e News, which covers energy and the environment, is on the story. And a hat tip to Walt Hickey and his Numlock News for the link. Quote, A winter dredge survey showed the overall population fell from 405 million in 2020 to 282 million in 2021, driven largely by a sharp drop in the number of juvenile crabs, which hit their lowest level since 1990. While it's normal for the blue crab population to fluctuate from year to year, no one's certain what caused this year's steep decline. Quote, I must admit, I'm a little surprised that conditions are relatively benign. I don't think there's any environmental condition that could be driving it. End quote. Said Tom Miller, a professor of fisheries science and director of the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Sciences founding campus, the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory in Solomons, Maryland. End quote. The story continues, quote, Bill Sealing, executive vice president of the Chesapeake Bay Seafood Industries Association, complained that everybody's trying to make a big deal about the supply of crabs, but he said there's an easy explanation. There's good years and bad years, end quote. The article notes prices have doubled. Quote, Bill Paulshuk, the owner of Bill's Seafood and Catering Company in Perry Hall, Maryland, who began his business in the back of a truck 42 years ago when he was only 17, said a pound of jumbo lump crab meat that he sold for $24.95 in 2019 now goes for $49.99 but that has not translated into higher profits. We're really giving the jumbo lump away at cost, said Paul Schuck. And back to ceiling, quote, there's no expose to be found. There's no evil person behind this or anything. Crabs are scarce this year because crabs periodically have been scarce and prices are high because everybody wants to buy crab meat here, end quote. I mean, that's global climate change all over. Good years and bad years, and then bad years and bad years and bad years. That is it for today. This show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotke.org. Folks, thanks for letting me be your podcast comrade for the last two weeks. It's been delightful to tell you stories, and I hope you found them interesting. Jackson Bird will be back at his post on Monday. Ta-ta.